all that kind of stuff. So anyway, this note says that they're on vacation. And so the stepson's like, yeah, this doesn't seem right. So he starts kind of, you know, doing the thing where you peek in the windows, that kind of stuff. And he sees that the house is just in complete disarray. Like, just torn all the pieces, shit everywhere, basically. Um, he says there's trash piled up. It just looks like a scene. So I guess he is able to make his way into the home, starts walking around. There's bags of trash, trash piled up. He said there was like vomit in both toilets of the house. That's weird. Yeah, and that there was a really strange smell in the house. So, you know, never a good thing when people are missing and the house smells funkier than James Brown. No, I'm sure at this point he's really worried because... Yeah. Yeah. So he phones the police. They make their way over and they immediately put together like, hey, this is a crime scene. Like something has definitely happened here. The police find blood stains in the house, on the tile, in the bathrooms, the kitchen, um, even in Peterson's bed, in her car, the trunk of her car, um, even on the kitchen blender. There was a cutting board that had some blood on it, and they even found some blood, like, in the blender. So you got to wonder, like, how the fuck does that happen? Oh, that's weird. Very strange. So they just know something really terrible has happened. Um, and also, the, there's a basement and there's a garage. And both of those um, rooms or whatever are definitely, like, there's been a crime scene here, right? So the police start piecing all this together. And a couple of days later, July 5th, so that would have been, like, two days after the discovery of this empty, fucked up house, um, Peter London is arrested. And they soon, you know, kind of piece together that Peterson, uh, Marianne Peterson and her two sons had been killed and dismembered. And they said, you know, they think that maybe the first had been done in the basement or at least one had been done in the basement. And then at some point, maybe the other two in the garage. And I guess they kind of pieced that together because the garage definitely seemed like more of a scene. And there was even a freezer on the property um, in a shed kind of in her backyard. And they even found some traces of blood in that freezer. And they started examining. They found some human tissue on an angle grinder. And so they came to realize uh, out in the garage that this is probably where, you know, at least two people had been killed. This angle grinder had been used most likely to dismember these bodies. Um, now, that's that right there strikes me as totally crazy. Yeah. Because I've used an angle grinder or any grinder. Anyone that has knows that would not be clean. That would not be easy to do. That would be a damn mess. Which explains... To cut up a body I with guess, an angle grinder. why they found blood essentially... Everywhere. All over the house. Right. Yeah. Well, they also found about a 100 visible cut marks on the garage floor, oh, so, so they were able to determine that he had used an axe and had dismembered these people with this axe. Literally chopping the bodies up of a woman and two kids. And with some brute force, if you got to think about yes. axe marks and actually being in the basement or the garage floor, because most garages have that concrete yeah. floor, so you'd have to really put some force in to be able to, one, I think, dismember three bodies, but also to make those kind of marks, over a oh, yeah. hundred marks on a concrete floor. And you're you're not taking proper care of an axe either, using it like that, I'm just saying. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> well, as a man, I appreciate your input on that. Well, I'm just saying that edge is going to be dulled yeah. by that concrete floor yeah. and the bones. I'm, I'm interested that that's what you're um, thinking about right now, but well, okay, well, we'll move on. So Peter London said, well, he had a story, of course. He had a reason for all of this. Huh. And so he says that he was over at Mary Ann's house and that he'd heard some screams and that this was in June, like sometime maybe the 16th or the 17th. He couldn't quite remember. So you got to remember by the time these people are found missing is July 3rd. So it'd been a couple of weeks at this point. But he says that uh, he heard these screams. He found Mary Ann in the basement and that she had just went crazy and killed her sons and that she was on drugs and she was unconscious next to the boys, like, where she had taken all these drugs. And so maybe she was trying to kill herself. He didn't know, you know, that kind of thing. But that he saw this scene, he flew into a rage, and he beat her to death. But that he was too afraid to call the police because of his 
uh, previous, you know, criminal. My previous killing my mom. Yeah. His, right. His, so he was really afraid to tell the truth. That kind of thing. That's... Which, that reminds me of the case in Colorado with that guy, what was his name, Chris Watts, that claimed, you know, he killed his wife and two daughters. Right. But he claims that he caught his wife murdering their two daughters and that he flew into a rage and killed his wife. Right. He was just doing the right thing. Yeah. the father's love. Yes. And that's why he took their bodies and put them in an oil tank out at that industrial site. Right. But, but see, that kind of reminds me of this. Right. Like how you blame the victim and, yeah, you know. Yeah, they're not even here to defend themselves. And you're just going to put all this crap on them. But I believe his story. I'm going to be honest. I believe his story. It seems totally plausible. After having killed your mom, she made him do it. By, you know, she being, was asking for it. Right. Well, she was probably wearing something. She was probably was wearing like, something revealing invite, as well. Hey, I'm, I'm wearing an outfit that invites murder. Right. And so, yeah. 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 And uh, and then now he's, you know, beat up that woman, flew, you know, flipped out on her kid that married him. And he moves over here. And now, you know, this other woman has made him kill her. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, I, I just, it's a, just a, just a series of unfortunate events for pe poor Peter. I don't know why they didn't believe Peter. him. Okay, so of course the cops know that this is complete bullshit. I mean, they're like, yeah, right. okay. So he's sitting in jail. They keep questioning him. I mean, they're basically telling him, like, you are so full of it. Like, we know this is bullshit. So he finally, I guess, confesses. And this would have been October 13th of 2000. He um, finally confessed that he and Marianne had argued because he had heard her on the phone with another man, like sweet talking this other guy, and that it made him really mad. Well, you got to think about, well, okay, first of all, she's a prostitute. You met her in a brothel, bro. You met her in a brothel. I mean, who's to say she wasn't speaking to a client, right? Or still selling that thing. Well, I mean, she probably is. I doubt she stopped doing that just because she's like seeing Peter. That's I mean, my job, bro. Right, exactly. So anyway, he says that it really made him mad, whatever. They they started fighting and that he like threw her on the bed and he broke her neck. Oops. Because that's a classic Peter move right there. And I guess her sons came in, you know, heard the struggle, came in, of course, jump into the pile trying to fight this guy who's attacking their mom. He ends up breaking her son's necks as well. Could you imagine killing these two boys? Four kids? No. So then he's stuck with these three bodies, and he puts them in the deep freezer. Because remember I told you there was a freezer on the right. property in a shed? So he takes the bodies, puts them out there. So a couple of days later, which would have been June 19th, so he's trying to figure out his game plan here, he decides to go shopping, and he buys an axe, some rubber gloves, plastic bags, cleaning products. And that's when he decides to dismember the bodies and place them in these plastic garbage bags. Now, imagine being at the register there, working at whatever store. Here comes this guy with an axe, rubber gloves, two or three bottles of cleaner or bleach. What would be your first thought? Well, my first thought is that my job is to ring up your purchases, and I'm not here to make judgment calls about your purchases. Oh, I'm totally going to this dude <laughs> getting rid of a body. Yeah, well, yeah, he's of course, killing that, people. that'd be the first thing you would think. But if right. I know this person's a maniac, I'm not going like, well, yeah, to. I'm not going to say. I'm not going to be like, "Excuse me, sir, are you a serial killer?" Yeah, I'm on the phone <laughs> with the police, and you know, no, yeah. I'm not going to do any of that. But I'm totally going to judge this guy. Oh well, yeah, probably. Um, so, you know, he places the body parts in different trash bags, basically, in these plastic bags. And he puts some of them out on the curb for pickup, for trash pickup. That's crazy. It is. And then he took some of the other body parts and placed them around town in different, you know, dumpsters and trash bins. And the sad part is the bodies have never been recovered. So when the cops find out that he's dumped these bodies basically in like a landfill, you know, that they're probably in a landfill someplace, uh, they dug through over 10,000 tons of trash. That's a lot of trash. Yeah. Trying to find these bodies, never able to recover them. So, of course, Peters goes to prison. He's found guilty. He's serving life sentence right now in prison. So while he has been in this prison in Denmark after murdering these three people, he has been married twice. So those ladies just keep lining up for him, and he's changed his name twice. And so right now, instead of Peter London, he's going by Bjarne Scornberg. Yeah, which sounds like a Bond villain. 
Yeah, either that or it's a good porn name. Beyond Scornbird. I don't know, yeah. I just think it sounds like a Bond villain. And in 2009, he wrote an autobiography called A Murderer's Confessions. I would have named it Break Your Neck. <laughs> just saying. I would have named it Protect Your Neck. Yeah, Protect so, Your Neck. anyway, got any Wu-Tang fans out there? So, A Murderer's Confession uh, didn't have great sales, surprisingly. Like, it wow. didn't do that well. But I guess around um, this time, it sold about 5,000 copies. So I guess if you'd like to read his autobiography, you can find that probably somewhere out there on the internet. Yeah, or maybe you'll see it at Goodwill. Maybe. So here we go. That was Peter London, and he was living in Maggie Valley when he committed its first murder and basically went on to become a serial killer. He killed across the world. I mean, basically, he took it international. Yeah, and so, his M.O. was definitely the strangulation, breaking the necks. Very violent. To break someone's neck. That's not easy. Very violent. Yeah, well, very violent to hack up a body. Well, that's true, too. With an axe and an angle grinder. Well, we've always said here at Mountain Murders that once it, you know, you can accidentally kill someone. Stuff happens. But once you uh, decide to cut bodies up, then that's just a whole nother level of crazy in my book. Uh, yeah, that definitely takes it to the next level, but then you've got to consider the guy scored a 39 out of 40 points. Oh, that, that was nothing for him. Psychopath checklist. I kind of want to take this psychopath test and just see what we score. I'm not sure you should. Well, anyway, speaking of other murders that hit close to home, because it's just really weird to think that they lived in the house that's just like down the street from my mom. Yeah. So the next time we go visit my mom, I'm going to be super weirded out. Like, that's the murder house. Oh, uh, yeah, we we may even put a picture of the murder house up. Yeah, actually, we were thinking about adding a photo of the murder house to our Patreon account for those folks who um, check in at different levels. If you want to throw us a couple of bucks, of course, you can find us on Patreon, and we gladly accept your donations because, you know, we do this for fun. We're not really making any money off of it. It's, oh, no. It's kind of a fun hobby, but it does help us, um, you know, maintain equipment and that kind of stuff. Yes, and uh, you can uh, find us there on uh, Facebook at Mountain Murders. And wherever you listen to podcasts, of course, we are on Patreon. You can get the RSS feed from Patreon. Uh, we are also on Spreaker.com, Mountain Murders. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox. Any major market for podcasts, no matter where you listen, we should be there. Yeah, iTunes. So anyway, um, thanks for checking us out. We're glad to be back in business. Yeah, we're very excited to be back. And we're going to start posting more bonus content on our Patreon page. Um, we've actually had toyed with the idea of uh, possibly posting some sort of like little mini episodes there. Yeah. Where we may be doing, you know, additional content as far as whatever our weekly story is about, but maybe some other ranting. Yeah, some funny stuff too. Other true crime types of news and information, you know, that kind of stuff. Yes, so, sir. Yeah. So we appreciate you guys listening and uh, you might want to go check out Peter London because he seems like a real gem of a guy. Yeah, he seems really good and he um, might... Be up for getting married again. <laughs> yeah, ladies. He's single, probably. 